Welcome to the Uproar Live YouTube page. If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe. This is your way to stay tuned with any encouragement that we are sending out every single week. So take a moment and click the subscribe button now. Now, if you are also looking for a word that is bound to feel like God is speaking to you himself, bound to make you feel like you are not alone through your circumstances and what you were going through, this is going to be the message for you. And we don't want you to keep it to yourself. So be sure to share it with a friend, a family member, a coworker, or whoever you know. And if you want to give and connect with the ministry, we encourage you to do so in that moment by using one of the various methods that you see on your screen. Or if you would like more information, you can click the description. Now, let's get to this word. Now, I don't know how many people in here frequently fly, you know, because of ministry, God has opened up some cool doors in my life where I've gotten a chance to travel all around the world. And, and I don't know one person that travels that doesn't get stressed out at one part in the process. And that is check-in. When you have to check in a bag and you have to pick it up and put it on the scale and pray that it's not over the limit. Now, I learned a disturbing thing over the summer that, you know, bag weight in the U.S. tends to be heavier than what they allow in Asia. So I packed based upon what American Airlines told me was okay. I start flying on Air Asia, and their requirements give you 20 pounds less. And unlike the U.S., it's not like $60 to add a bag. No, try like $150, $200 to add a bag. And you got to go through this process about six more times. Yeah, it'll make you a little sick in the stomach. Because you, you pack for where you're going. You pack for what you're expecting. You, you pack for what you think you're going to need. And when you get to that moment and they tell you you're over the limit, it, it brings some feelings with it a little bit. It's, there's a word I like to use for this moment. It's called restrictions. And nobody likes being restricted. Whether it's with your health, nobody gets excited when you're told what you can't eat. When, 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 it, when it comes to your, your, your fun, nobody likes to be told what you, you can't do. When, when it comes to restrictions in dating, it's, 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 it's not all that exciting. Restrictions in marriage. There, there's nowhere in your life where the term restrictions is used that causes you to get excited. Truthfully. Whenever you run into restrictions, it can cause some feelings to come about. One, it, it can cause you to get frustrated. I got frustrated checking that bag in. I got frustrated having to move 10 pounds or 20 pounds from one bag to another. I got frustrated trying to find ways to shove shoes into my backpack and, and ways to get shoes into my carry-on. It brings a sense of frustration when you feel restricted. When you feel restricted, it, it brings a sense of fatigue. It's, it's tiring to be restricted. To be restricted in time, restricted in money. Restricted in the amount of hours that you have to get things done. It, it can cause you to be tired. I wonder today how many people are tired of the restrictions on your life. It can cause you to be fatigued. It, it can cause you to sometimes feel like a failure. When you look at everything you can't do. And you look at what everybody else is doing. It can cause you to feel like a failure. 
restrictions can also bring about fear. There's been restrictions set on my life that in seasons made me fearful. All of these feelings and all of these emotions can be brought about because of restrictions. But ultimately, what is restrictions or what are restrictions supposed to do? They're supposed to push you into a realm when you're walking with God that is actually good for you if you're allowing them to do what they're supposed to do. And that is faith. Whenever you feel restrictions on your life that you know are not God. Now, there are restrictions that we have to live by. We can't date how we want to date and who we want to date. We can't just eat what we want to eat and expect to not have our arteries all clogged up. You know, there, there are restrictions that, that, that are in place to, to save us. There's things you can do in marriage. There's things you can't do in marriage. There's, there is restrictions, but whenever God sets restrictions, it's so that our destiny is not de destroyed or killed. But whenever you feel like you're restricted and God has called you to more or God has not called you to live by those restrictions, it's supposed to put you in a place where you go back to the drawing board and say, Lord, what do I have to do to get my faith in order? Because the thing about restrictions is the word restrictions or restricted often goes hand in hand with this C word called capacity. You ever step onto an elevator and they tell you what the restrictions are as far as how many people can be on the elevator? What determines the restrictions? Capacity. What can the elevator handle? Even with baggage, Yes, they're making money off the baggage, but the reason they don't let you just bring 100 pounds, if everybody on the flight brought 100 pounds, the plane would sink to the ground. It is capacity. And if enough people's bags are overweight, they will not even let you slide. They'll say, we're sorry, you cannot check the bag. I had that happen once when I checked in late. It is capacity. Capacity and capacity is what sets restrictions. What I'm going to show you today is that your restrictions are determined by your capacity. And your capacity and your faith go hand in hand. God did not call us to live by restrictions. God called us to live by faith. For the just, Habakkuk said, shall live by, I don't live by my fear. I don't live by my reality. I don't live by my bank account. I don't live by my doctor. I don't live by my medicine. All of that stuff is great and all of that stuff has a place. But God did not say it's what I live by. I live by my faith. What is my faith? It's the thing God promised me. It's the thing God told me I was going to do. It's the thing that God brought me into this world to bring down. It's the Goliath that I have to slay. It is the Pharaoh I have to bring down. It is the sea I have to split. Whatever God calls you to do, that's what you build your life around. That's how you determine who do I date? Who do I marry? Do they align with what God promised? you? What job should I take? What church should I join? All of that is tied to your faith. So once God shows you what your life is supposed to look at, look like Noah, build the boat according to the pattern. Moses, build the tabernacle according to the pattern. What God tells you he's going to do through your life is what determines the pattern for your life. And your pattern is not my pattern. And my pattern is not your pattern. So I don't walk by your pattern. Yeah. I walk by my faith. 
The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says we walk by faith, not by sight. This lets me know that often what God promised me and my reality will not match. If I live by my reality, I'll never get to my promise. So often what I wake up to, what I experience, what I go to work to, sometimes what you go home to, is not going to match what God told you. And does that mean you quit? Does that mean you throw in the towel? No. This is how you give when you don't have. This is how you love the unlovable. This is how you speak hope in the midst of death. You, you're not living by what you see. You're living by what God has promised you. Amen. And even when they tell you it's impossible, you say things like, nothing yes. is impossible for God. Yes. Jesus said it like this in Mark 11. He says, whoever says to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart. I've read this before and I said before that you got to understand your mountain knows your voice. If you don't speak to it, it's not moving. Your mountain does not know your thoughts. Your mountain does not know your emotions. Your mountain knows your voice. When's the last time you talked to your mountain? He said, speak to it. Look at somebody say, speak. speak. And shall not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he says shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever. He says, therefore, I say, whatever things you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, you shall have them. Jesus says, if you can walk like it's done, don't be surprised when you wake up and it is. If you can't walk like it's done, it may be because that's not for you. You know that something is for you when you build your life around it and you're speaking to it. Even though it's bigger than you, you have the courage to speak to it. God says that's how you know. And I say this all the time. If you can quit on it, it was never supposed to be yours. And side note. If they could quit on you, you were never supposed to be theirs. It is capacity. That's what God looks for. Capacity. When it came to the manna, every man ate according to his appetite. God has the ability to fill you. The question is, what kind of appetite do you bring to the table? It is capacity. And how do we demonstrate capacity? It's saying, Lord, whatever you give me, whatever you have given me, I'm going to use it to bring you glory. If you ask for it, you got it. Whatever you give me, if it's five talents, I'm going to work it. If it's 10 talents, I'm going to work it. Whatever you give me, if it's one talent, I'm, I'm going to work it because you said that if I'm faithful with few things, I saw this scripture this week. I never saw it before. I, I knew when the prophet came to find David, I knew David was working with the sheep and David was faithful with the sheep. But long before the prophet came to, to Jesse's house, God told Samuel in 1 Samuel 13, 14, he says, I have found a man after my heart. I never knew exactly when God found David. I, I don't know what age David was when God found him. I know what age he was when the prophet came. He was 16, roughly. But I don't know what age David was when God actually said, you're the one. But I was reading in my devotional in Psalms this week. And the psalmist had said this in Psalm 78. It says, he chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfold. From following the nursing ooze, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. He says, I saw David when he was giving the sheep milk. 
Who would have thought that God would say, that's my God. All he's doing is giving sheep milk. I don't know which day God saw him giving sheep milk. But God said, I'm going to make him a king. Because I can trust him to never think he's above giving sheep milk. It is often the mundane things that we do that show God that we are ready for more. It's the thing we don't think matters. It's the offering that we didn't think mattered. It's the kind deed that we didn't think mattered. It's the event we showed up to help with that we didn't think mattered. God does not look for us to be great with great things. He looks for us to walk in greatness. While we are still struggling to figure out who we are. Joshua, it says that God knew he was going to be Moses' successor in Exodus. He said, I know he's the one because he tarries in the tabernacle while everybody else is playing. He says, I know he's the one because while everybody goes to party, this dude is just hanging in the lobby. He just loves being in my house. He is Moses' successor. God is always just looking for somebody that can be faithful where they are. Because when you're faithful with nothing, you are showing God that you have the capacity for so much. Say it's faith. Faith, faith, one more, and I'm moving on quickly in Hebrews 11. It says, now faith, give me verse 1, Hebrews 11, verse 1. I'll wait for you to pull that up. It says, faith, though, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, the substance. Faith is to heaven what money is to earth. You don't need a lot of money to move heaven. Faith is what moves heaven. It's the substance. It's the stuff. It shows God that you're ready for more because God sees you spending substance when you walk by faith. It's the evidence of things not seen. What that means is People can tell you you're crazy for dreaming it. People can tell you you're crazy for talking about it. But the fact that I keep walking in it, God says, is the evidence that it's going to be mine. I just keep doing it, but you're crazy. I keep doing it, but you're losing your mind. But I keep doing it. You're losing the best years of your life, but I keep doing it. You're stupid for that. You're dumb. You're crazy. You're insane. But I keep doing it. God says every time... You do not, as we said last week, pause for the cause. You are building up your evidence to prove that the life you're chasing is the life you deserve. Most people feel like imposters when they get something big because often they struggle with, did I pay the price tag to deserve it? And God says, when you've been living a life of faith, you don't ever have to feel like an imposter. Your evidence is the proof that you deserve the life that you have. And if the devil really wants to mess somebody up, it says in verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. If he really wants to mess you up, what he'll do is he'll get you to stop believing God and start living by fear, and start living by faith, because without faith, you can do all this nice stuff, but without faith, you can't please God. So if I was the devil, what I would do is I would do my best to cripple your faith. 
Why do you think Jesus told Peter? He said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. The enemy has desired to sift you as wheat. But I prayed that your faith would not fail. Why did Jesus pray for Peter's faith? It's because as long as you don't lose your faith, you can hit rock bottom, but you will always be in position for a comeback. Whatever you do, do not lose your faith. Keep walking big, talking big, living big, sacrificing big. And God says it's only a matter of time before your whole life becomes big. Because as long as you have the faith, you have the substance. As long as you have the faith, you have the evidence. Do not allow the devil to hit you so hard that he takes away your faith. Faith, because your faith is tied to your comeback, to somebody that's been knocked down. I have a feeling today that your faith is going to start rising, that your faith is having a comeback, that your faith is getting ready to move some mountain that's been in your way. Whatever you do, don't let the devil take your faith. Say, I'm keeping my faith. Israel had made it back to Jerusalem after 70 years in Babylon. They finally made it back. We talked about the book of Ezra. We worked our way through the book of Haggai. And I shared last week how God sent Haggai and Zechariah to encourage them because all of the attacks caused them to stay still. All the attacks caused them to take their focus off of what God sent them to do. And that's what attacks are designed to do. Attacks are designed by the devil to cripple your faith. So that something that should take two weeks to get done ends up taking you 20 years. So they make it back to Jerusalem. They lay the foundation. The attacks start to come. And what shocks me about Christians is you act like the devil is supposed to just let you tiptoe into a better life. You don't think he's ticked. You don't think he's angry. You don't think he realizes that if he don't stop you now, he's not going to be able to stop what God is doing in your life. So, so why is he going to let you go now? A mentor told me before, he said, you have to be careful because every Moses is most vulnerable when you are in the infancy of your faith. Why do you think Pharaoh killed, was trying to kill the babies? He was trying to kill Moses while he was vulnerable, while he was weak. He knew that when Moses is standing before Pharaoh with a staff, I can't touch him, but let me kill him while he's getting started. Whenever you get started for God, the enemy is going to try his best to destroy you. So the enemy was trying to hit the Hebrew people with everything he had. And it worked a little bit. They laid the foundation. And it wasn't one year that went by. It wasn't two years that went by. Three years would have been a lot, but it wasn't three years. It wasn't four, it wasn't five, it wasn't six years. It wasn't seven years, it wasn't eight years. It wasn't nine. They laid the foundation. And then... Ten years went by. Sometimes when I travel to poorer parts of the world, you'll see buildings that families have been working on for sometimes 20 and 30 years. They're just concrete structures that maybe a father started and hands it over to his child and his child will work on it, work on it, work on it and get older and then hand it over to his child and and and. They're hoping to finish it so that their legacy has land and a house to live in one day. And sometimes they, they never get finished because it's hard to finish something when it drags out. It's hard to finish something when it should have been done in a month and you've been working on it for 15 years. It gets harder because life doesn't stop. Bills don't stop. Life doesn't stop lifing, as I call it. Ten years has gone by. And they have been discouraged. 
The devil has really pushed them over the limit. They're done. Haggai challenged them last week. We talked about they, they went back to their personal lives. They gave up on the things of God. And Haggai had to challenge them. Now, Zechariah has a different kind of task. He's there to encourage them. He's there to help them get their faith in order again. The book of Zechariah is mostly prophecies about Jesus. One of which I'm going to teach this Resurrection Sunday months from now. But it's, 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 it's mostly about Jesus. It gives us glimpses to Jesus and Satan arguing in heaven before Jesus ever comes down. There, it gives us a glimpse of Jesus saying, let me take off the robe and fight him right now. And the angels have to hold Jesus back and say, not yet, not yet. But one day, you'll have a chance to crush his head. But you can't do it in heaven. You're going to have to go down. All this is in the Bible. They call Jesus by name in the Old Testament. Yahshua. Prophecies about revelations. Zechariah is not looking at yesterday. He's hardly even looking at right now. He's, he's looking at tomorrow. And why is this so important? Because your faith can only be strong if you trust that God has control of your tomorrow. Faith is not seen right now. And if I don't trust that God has a plan or that God has insight into my tomorrow, I, I, I can't live by faith. So he's encouraging them and allowing them to know that, that God doesn't just see tomorrow. God is looking thousands of years down the line and has a plan. For somebody, I know things are out of control right now and life is not where you want it to be. But you serve a God that has a plan. He sees so far. And where you are right now does not surprise him. And whatever you've done or whoever you hurt, he wants you to know today that it has not changed his mind about what he is trying to do in your life. So Zechariah starts out simple. He's just telling the Hebrew people, come home. Come home. Turn to God. It seems so simple until your life has drugged you so far. Turn to God. It's been 10 years. Turn to God. God let you do what you were doing for 10 years. Turn to God. Turn to God because there cannot be a revival in your life if there is no repentance in your life. So turn to God. Turn to God. And then he gives them this vision. It says he looks up and he sees a young man with a measuring line in his hand. He looks up. Again, he looks up again. Every time he looked up, he saw something. He looked up again. The Bible says, for I look to the hills, for that's where my help comes from. Jesus said in John 4, 35, say not there are four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, lift up your eyes for the fields are already white with harvest. You, you cannot see what God is doing in your life. When you're looking down. So he lifted up his head. You ever seen somebody in a bad season with their head down and you say, man, lift your head up. When you lift your head up, you are able to see what God is doing. Most of us, it's not that God is not moving. It's just you're either looking down or you're looking at your problem. And you're not looking to God. He saw a young man with a measuring line in his hand. A plumb line in his hand. Now, plumb lines were used for builders. 
They were used for angles and buildings and, and often, you know, they would stand far away on a mountain and they would drop the plumb line down because it had a weight and would give it a perfect line. This is how they would get the pyramids in order. So when you look at them, they go in a straight line and you look at all these ancient structures and you say, how did they do that? They would get on a mountain on a high elevation and hold the plumb line and they, they would send signals to the builders on where to put the cornerstones so that the line would be straight. They were plumb lines. And this young man has a plumb line, and plumb lines are not bad unless you use them in the wrong way. He said, what are you doing with the plumb line? He said, I'm measuring Jerusalem. I'm measuring it. I want to see how big it's going to be. I want to see how long it's going to be. I'm, I'm measuring the, the height, the length, the breadth thereof. And it says that the angel talked with me, he went forth and another went to meet him. And he said, run, tell this young man that Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle there. For I say, saith the Lord will be a wall under round about her and I will be the glory in the midst of her. The reason he stops him is because this man is getting ready to put limits on God. Not realizing that when God starts something in someone's life or when God starts something in general, it, it cannot have boundaries put on it. It, it. it is not something that can have limits to it. You cannot tell the God that does exceeding and abundantly above all that we may ask or think. You can only go here and you can only go there. No, God says in this season of your life, you think I went through all of this to get you back in the game after 10 years of sitting still just to build something that is small, something that can be handled, something you can manage? No, God says I pulled you out because this thing Thing is going to be massive. This thing is going to be so big that walls cannot contain it. This thing is going to be so big that only God can maintain it. I want to tell somebody today, stop building walls around what God is trying to do. Stop putting limits on what God has promised you. I have not seen, ear has not heard, hasn't even entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for those that love him he says run this man is about to think too small plan too small and God is telling somebody today you've been dreaming too small he says tell him to put the plumb line away because this thing is too big for him to limit. He's trying to encourage the Hebrew people and letting them know that what God is getting ready to do is major. This is why he's telling them after 10 years of sitting still, I need you to get in the game because this thing is going to be so big. And God is going to be at the center of it. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. But they got this problem. God is talking to them about greatness. God is talking to them about something massive. But they've got to wrestle with their reality. They got to wrestle with now. They're still looking at ruins. They're still looking at rubble. They, they still got haters that are coming at them. They still have attacks that are happening. This thing was so bad. The Bible says they were being sued by the people that were in Jerusalem. They've got legal issues. They've got money issues. They've got attack issues. And in spite of all of this, God, you're going to tell me big things are coming. 
I've sat in church services where it was hard for me to receive messages about big things and great things because my life was in so many ruins. You're talking to me about greatness and my bank account's in the negative. You're talking to me about greatness and I don't even have, as a pastor at the time, I don't even have nobody to serve in parking lot, in the parking lot. I don't have Sunday school teacher. You're talking to me about greatness. I remember going to conferences and leaving so discouraged. Because I would see the technology, I would see the worship teams, I would see what they had in the parking lots, I, I would see this, I would see kids ministries that look like Disneyland at some churches. And then I had to come back to my reality where I had a projector on a white wall, a five disc DVD changer that we played CDs on, Patapsico flea market speakers that I had to replace every couple weeks because they would blow. Amen. Metal chairs that I drove four hours into VA to pick up that I found on Craigslist. Carpet tiles I laid down that I bought at a discount place because the warehouse had concrete floors. I saw all of this greatness and had to go back to my reality. I got excited when I was there. But sometimes the excitement dies off when you go home to your normal. They hear what God can do. They've seen what God can do in the past. But we got to get started. And we don't have nothing to get started with, really, God. So God comes and starts talking to Zerubbabel, to Zerubbabel by Zechariah. And he says, tell Zerubbabel this. And I believe the reason the people are discouraged is because the leader is discouraged. God never has to tell you something that doesn't apply to you. You ever had somebody tell you something that really didn't apply to you? I remember one time I went to this church service and this prophet started speaking and he called me to the front and everything he said about me was not me. I was like, I don't know who that word was for, but I know me. There was nothing about that to this day that applied to me. Started talking about my childhood. I was like, I didn't go through that as a child. I felt so uncomfortable. In the Old Testament, they would have stoned him. They said, stone a prophet that speaks lies. But whenever somebody is speaking things over you that don't apply to you, it frustrates you. But whenever somebody is speaking something to you that does, it is meant to either convict or encourage you. So God is telling Zerubbabel, because it always starts with the top. He says, this thing will not happen by power nor by might. You're not going to have the money. It's, it's not going to be your profile on the app. That's what he's saying. It's not going to be your resume. It's not going to be your credentials. It's not going to be your contacts. It will not be by spirit or by might. He says, there is nothing about you that's going to make this happen. Wow. So as long as you keep trying to do it through you, you're going to be stuck and frustrated. He says, this will not happen by power nor by might. This is going to happen through my spirit. So what this means that in this season, you need to become more spiritual. I can always tell when I'm dealing with a spiritual person by how they talk, by what they tolerate, by what they're serious about. God says this thing is not going to happen in the natural. It's going to happen 
in the spirit. So if you're not getting your spirit together, you're going to miss it. He says, through my spirit, he says, saith the Lord of hosts, go backwards, just one slide. He says, who art thou? He's talking to Zerubbabel, oh, great mountain, because by power or by might, you can't move a great mountain. He says, Zerubbabel, because God is with you, this big mountain that's standing in front of you, it doesn't matter. Maybe your mountain is not an actual mountain. Maybe your mountain is a cancer. Maybe your mountain is your marriage. Maybe your mountain is a family member. Maybe your mountain is finances. Maybe your mountain is taxes. Maybe your mountain is your business. Maybe your mountain is, is unforgiveness. God says, whatever your mountain is, when he starts walking with you, big mountains become flat. Big problems start to to diminish. God says, if I can get you to walk with me, don't be surprised if you get a chance to say bye to that mountain, bye to that cancer, bye to that sickness, bye to that depression, bye to that anxiety, bye to that grief, bye to that pain, bye to those bills. God says, whenever I find a person that walks with me, mountains become flat in their presence. I want to talk to some people that are ready to walk with God. Some people that are ready to see mountains start disappearing. Mountains that you've been staring at for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, but they're starting to tick you off. God says, in this season, I'm about to make your mountains crumble. Am I talking to you? Whose word is this? Who is ready for a mountain to crumble this Sunday morning? God is saying, all I need you to do is get in the spirit and walk with me. And mountains will fall. It doesn't matter how big it is, how unlikely it is, how impossible it seems. God says big mountains become flat. Zerubbabel. He says, you shall bring forth the headstone with shoutings and crying. See, sometimes God has to let a mountain get so big that you won't be too tough to show your emotions when he removes it. If you ain't ready to cry if he does it, you ain't ready for it. You haven't been broken enough. You haven't been betrayed enough. You haven't lost years of your life. But when God allows you to go through some stuff, you know you're ready for a shift or a change in your life. When you could be six foot five and 280 pounds. But when he does it, you will be on your knees crying like a child. When he saves that mother, saves that father, saves that child, opens up that door, gets that man in church, gets that woman serious, that's how you know. He says, Zerubbabel, your hands have laid the foundation of this house. Your hands will finish it. Because there's one thing you got to understand about God. Whatever God starts... He finishes. To every parent, this is why he says, train up the child in the way they should go. You started it. But I never let something get started without finishing. When they grow old, somewhere in between when you started it and old age, God says, I promise you, I will start, I will finish what was started. Be confident in this. He that starts something will finish it. So he says, this thing is going to be finished by you, Zerubbabel. And I love when God talks like this. Because he, he doesn't say that anybody's going to finish it. He says, Zerubbabel, you started it, you're going to finish it. When God puts a purpose on your life, guess what, Zerubbabel? Before it's finished, sickness can't get you. 
before it's finished, you can't die. No, if you build the boat, you're going to finish it. I don't care if it takes you 100 years to finish it. You are not, nothing is going to happen to you until that boat is finished. This is why Paul had to say, I'm ready. I finished. Take me, God. Because when God gives you an assignment, God is not going to allow anything to happen to you until the assignment is complete. Zerubbabel, you are going to finish this. Has not the Lord sent me unto you? For who? Say who. Touch somebody and say, not you. <laughs> For who has despised the day of small things? Everything that God has done that has been great has come from something small. Whether it's little David, baby Moses, Jesus in a manger. God always does his greatest works with small things. It's little rocks that bring down Goliath. It's the little boy's lunch that fed 20,000 people. Little, little, little. And you think your little is going to keep you from finishing. And God is saying, your little is great if you ever give it to me. For who has despised the day of small things? He's letting us know you're going to have to go through small to become major. And most people die in small because what was supposed to be a season becomes their normal. They get stuck in it. He says, who has despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and they shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. The, the plummet, the plummet, the plumb line. Now, I read this, and I got three minutes. I read this, and I said, why are you telling the people to rejoice when they see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand, but you yelled at the young man when he had his out? You saw that, right? He yelled at the young man and said, Jerusalem will not be measured. God will be the wall. You're yelling at this guy, but you're, you're, you're celebrating this guy. They both have plumb lines in their hands. But here's the difference. One has taken what's in his hands and put restrictions on God. The other is using what's in his hands to get started with God. It's perspective. And everybody in here, God has given you something to work with in life. Are you putting restrictions on God with it? Or are you getting started with it? Are you showing God that you have the capacity to build this, the rubber belt? Or are you putting restrictions and saying, oh, God can't do this and God can't do that. Do you know where I am? Do you know what my bills look like? What my time looks like? Do you know this? Do you? God says, Says, as long as you put restrictions on what I'm able to do, you'll see me do it for everybody else, but it'll seem like I'm skipping you. It's not that I'm doing it intentionally. It's just that when I look at your hand, I see a plummet putting restrictions on me. He says, when you see the plummet, it's so small, but it's going to build something so great. When you look at your hand, do you see what you have is small? Or do you see it as your opportunity to do something great? Moses, what's in your hand? A staff? Moses, you see a staff. You don't see a plague maker? 
You don't see my people's deliverance. It's in your hand. The problem is, as long as you see a staff, I'll never be able to use you to help somebody get delivered. What's in your hand? Imagine if David looked at his rock and rag and said, what is this? He has swords. He has, he has a helmet. He has, he has gear on. Uh, what is this? Rock? No. When you start to see that I have everything God needs me to have to do what God has caused me or called me to do, God says it is at that point that you begin the process of seeing your life. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It is at that moment that you begin to see your life begin to be a life that people see is over. The limit. God has no problem with our lives being over. The limit. The reason we have restrictions is because we keep putting limits on a limitless God. I'm so glad when I sat in that office with those people at that shoe store that's no longer in business. You hear the frustration. <laughs> and they discouraged me. They didn't build me up and say, hey, next time you should do this. Next time I, I would do that. They didn't coach me. But they gave me one of the greatest gifts they could give me. Rejection. Because anybody that knows me will tell you. How many ever saw the documentary, the, 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 the Last Dance, with Michael Jordan, all them, you know? And, and they had the coach from uh, the Utah Jazz, and he was saying how he intentionally basically tried to stay away from Michael Jordan all day. He didn't want to eat where he would eat because he knew how Michael Jordan played this sick game in his head. He would try to go to where his opponents were eating or a coach or a player and he would make up something they did to him, whether it was look at him wrong, side eye him, and that became his motivation to go out and play. That's how Michael Jordan played. He, he had to get motivation. His motivation came from finding an area of rejection, basically. And rejection either cripples you or makes you fight harder. But I can promise you this, you are not going to get to something great without being rejected at some point. I left frustrated. I left kind of angry at my friend. It was a quiet ride home because I told him we needed to be prepared. But I learned my lesson. I went back to my church and I began to work on my preaching. I began to read leadership books. I began to go to more and more conferences because I was determined in my small beginnings to not despise them. And as I said earlier, who would have thought, fast forward, that the very people that rejected me, embarrassed me, made me feel fatigued, made me feel like a failure in a lot of ways, had me so frustrated and then a little bit fearful, would push me to faith. And now, whether it's God's will or not, that's on God. I believe it is. But the very conference room where I was rejected could possibly be my office. To be at a place where we had a projector and a five-disc DVD changer. To be at a place where I can show bank records that prove that we have brought in millions of dollars since we've been in Owings Mills. We have brought in millions of dollars. Who would have thought this kid out of Brooklyn Homes that barely made it through high school 
would handle millions of dollars. There's a person in here right now that told me, they said, when we're ready to get the building, they're going to do their part, their part. We can add to it, but they're going to do their part to get 100% of our down payment for the loan. If I would have despised the day of small things and said, well, this is where I am and this is where I want to be. It's so far away. Why bother? I wouldn't be able to tell these stories today. And I share it to encourage you to let you know that where you are now is not where you're going to land. Your best days are not behind you. And this goes for somebody that may be 75, feeling like their best is behind them. If your best was behind you, you, you wouldn't be here today. Your best is ahead of you. But it does no good if I just preach it. Or like Zechariah, I tell you what God can do, but you don't receive it. God is saying, you may be in small days right now, small beginnings but you have not seen what he is about to do. What he started will be finished. David said it like this, Lord, fill my cup till it overflows. Lord, I want a life that is over the limit. I want a life that breaks restrictions. I want a life when people see me they see my capacity. I, I, I'll never forget, and we're going, we're getting ready to stand to our feet for the altar. When I sat down with, with my spiritual father, and he said, what do you want from me? Some people say the stage. Some people say all kinds of crazy stuff. I've been at tables where they said crazy stuff. I didn't say none of that. I said, one, I want a spiritual father. And he said, I could be that. The problem is not, can I be a father? The question is, can you be a son? That was the first thing he said. But he said, what do you want from me? Because what I've learned in life is any relationship you want, you have to be able to describe, to describe what your expectations are from it. Because if you can't describe it now, you'll either pervert it or lose it later. So I made it simple. I said, I want to see God the way you see God. That's all. Because if I can see God the way you see God, I can shake the world the way you shook the world. Because whenever you see somebody shake the world, it's not that they feel qualified truthfully they feel so unqualified. I've never met somebody great that says I'm capable. Truthfully, they're always scared to death. Yeah. But the reason they step out on battlefields against Goliath, the reason they step up the seas and ask God to let them split, the reason they say things like sun stand still or Lazarus come forth, the reason they say things like that is because they have such a big view of God. And they really believe that nothing is impossible. And I knew that if I could see God bigger, my life would be a life that was over the limit. And today, what God is saying is, I want to change the way you see me. If you could ever see me as big, you would chase after big stuff. If you could ever see me for great, then you wouldn't settle for mediocre. You would live a life that pursues bigger things than you. And God is looking for somebody today. He told Zechariah, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro. He is looking right here, right now. For his next preacher, his next singer, 
his next business owner that's going to be successful, his, his next big donor, his next nonprofit worker, the next model marriage. He's looking. And he's going from chair to chair to chair to chair to chair like duck, duck, goose. And the only question is when he gets to your chair, will he see somebody with the capacity that says, Lord, I'm ready for the restrictions to lift. Let my life be a life that is over the limit.